All right, everybody. This is Steve, and I am once again sitting in for the great Jordan Sheraton here at Status Quo. Folks, obviously, there's a big time thing going on over there in Ukraine right now. Russia is in there doing their worst. And what I want to do is try to explain to you what is happening over there in the best of my ability through my guest, Bob Hockett. Uh, Bob um, is just an amazing guy, and there he is. Um, so real quick, what I want to do, Bob, is just get everybody to understand that really, in my, in my opinion anyway, right, there are no real good guys here. Uh, there's a lot of people with interests. And obviously, Ukraine is one of the most resource rich regions in the area that unfortunately never caught up with the rest of the world. They're almost like a global South country on on so many levels. Um, but you did a remarkable um, dissertation, if you will, explaining the history of, of the Ukraine situation. And I'd like for you to tell our audience, w- explain, explain what's happening over there. Yeah. No, what a joy to, to talk with you again, Stephen, and especially about this particular subject. Um, there's a lot to be sort of recovered, a lot that people don't, I think, quite realize. So it's worth, I think, bringing it forward as, as you're wanting to do to kind of help provide a bit of context. So for one thing, um, uh, Vladimir Putin is, is right that there is a long history um, of Russia and Ukraine kind of going or being together in one form or another. And the distinction between the two countries and cultures and languages is a, ri- a bit less stark than some people think, right? The very first Russian state formation was in fact in Kyiv way back when, over a thousand years ago. Uh, And many Russians kind of trace the history of the Russian state and the ancestry of the Russian people as a separate people to that sort of early um, so-called Kievan Rus uh, culture, which was a sort of a combination of Vikings from Sweden uh, and local Slavic folk who all kind of came together um, when Viking traders kind of came down the Volga River from up north and sort of on their way to Byzantium sort of stopped and founded an empire right over in what is today uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, After all of that, the territory that is now covered by the country of Ukraine was sort of roughly divided in half with the western half of it being part of the Habsburg Empire, basically part of the Austro-Hungarian sort of formation on the one hand. Uh, And then the eastern part of the country was much more part of the Romanov uh, Empire or the Russian Empire. And that is actually one of the reasons that you find a significant distinction between the opinions uh, of those who live uh, in the western and northern parts of modern day Ukraine on the one hand, and those who live in the southern and eastern parts on the other. Those in the latter portion in the southern and eastern parts basically are are very largely or primarily Russian speaking uh, and oftentimes tend to be sort of Russian sympathizing and Russian leaning in their sort of orientations when it comes to sort of what countries they would like to be linked up with culturally and economically and the like. Um, Those in the western half of the country, having been part of the Habsburg formation, part of the the Austro-Hungarian empire, um, speak more traditional um, Ukrainian itself, not simply Russian, uh, and are a little bit more, um, I, I think, kind of cognizant of themselves as a distinct people, even if a related uh, people to Russia. So uh, all right from the get-go, right, the territory that is currently sort of demarcated Ukraine on the map is already, in a sense, significantly culturally divided. Um, And so when Putin says some of the things that he says about the sort of historic connections between the peoples and the ancient Russian connections to, and even more modern or recent Russian connections to Ukraine, or Russian connections to Ukraine, he's not wrong, at least about some parts of Ukraine, although some of his claims are perhaps a bit exaggerated if you're thinking in terms of Western Ukraine, sort of telescoping into the sort of contemporary uh, period, uh, or actually sort of maybe looking briefly at the Soviet period and then coming up to the forward, uh, to the current period. Um, Ukraine was a very important part of the Soviet Union, of course. It was sort of the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. It's also where an awful lot of the industrial capacities uh, of the Soviet Union, which, as you know, were, were enormous, um, were among the most enormous in the world. A lot of those, or at least the, the greater part of Soviet industrial capacity, um, was concentrated in territory that is now considered to be Ukrainian. A great deal of the Russian or Soviet military, I'm sorry, uh, a nuclear arsenal 
was based in Ukraine too, partly because of that industrial heritage and partly because that part is closer to Western Europe. And so it's a little sort of forward, um, a sort of leaning forward, you might say, on the part of the uh, the, the Soviet nuclear um, arsenal. It made sense to have a good bit of it um, in uh, Ukraine. Um, but Ukraine also suffered a great deal uh, during the Soviet period partly at the hands of Stalin, right? A lot of the um, uh, force, forcible sort of collectivization of agriculture took place there. Um, whether we view that collectivization as having been warranted or justified or not, it seems that many Ukrainians were sort of put out by it and many apparently died during that period, during those struggles. And so we know- Wasn't that, that the Kulaks? I'm just trying to keep my history right. The yeah, Kulaks, correct? Were the, okay, keep on. Called the Kulaks, um, who were essentially kind of small family farmers Farmers or sort of small peasant farmers who own their own blocks of land. Um, and my understanding bourgeois is, farmers. <laughs> sort of, right? Yeah, maybe petty bourgeois farmers. Um, and my understanding is that Stalin um, sort of took a look over to the West and looked in the United States where small family farms were being gobbled up by large agribusinesses precisely because it was a more efficient way to organize agricultural production and thought, well, we'll do the same thing over here, but instead of having it be, you know, Cargill uh, or some other private sector company that's kind of, um, again, swallowing up all these family farms that are being dispossessed after the Dust Bowl and during the Great Depression, we'll have the state do it. So basically we collectivize agriculture at the same time that Stalin did, but of course Stalin's collectivization um, is of course talked about as having been brutal, uh, whereas the American collectivization isn't, because of course it was done by private sector entities. But in any event, however we look at that particular period, certainly plenty of Ukrainians were uh, upset about it, and so a good many of them apparently welcomed the incoming Nazis when the when the Germans invaded in the summer of 1941, um, and for a while there was a good bit of collaboration between at least some Ukrainians, particularly in the western half of the country, and the Germans because they wanted to get rid of Stalin and they thought anybody who will get rid of Stalin or get rid of the the communist regime will be great. The problem for the Germans and all of that was they didn't seem to have any respect for the Ukrainians as a people any more than they had for the Russians as a people. They viewed them all as being lesser than the Aryans that the Germans claimed to be. Um, and so before long, the Ukrainians realized that the Germans were no friends of theirs either. Uh, and so you had a lot more renewed sort of Ukrainian, so, uh, Russian sort of collaboration or cooperation in driving out the Nazis. Then, of course, Ukraine was a very important part of the Soviet Union in the post-war era. And again, a lot of the sort of great industrial advances of the Soviet Union were done there. Um, a lot of um, um, sort of modern energy plants were, were based there, of course, most notably Chernobyl. Um, so you probably, you and I are both old enough to remember, even if we were rather youthful at the time, the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown and all the sort of horrors around that. That was all in Ukraine, but back in those days, they didn't describe it as Ukraine. They just said the Soviet Union because it was all sort of lumped together. In any Hold event, that thought for just a second, sure. just real quick, folks. Oh, yeah. I've done a terrible disservice to everyone here. First, first things first. I have just always assumed everyone knows who Bob Hockett is. Okay, because he's he's always on with me, and I'm always talking to him. He's the, the smartest guy I know. But let me just be clear. Bob Hockett is the lead dog at Cornell Law. I mean, he's, this is a sharp guy that knows history, knows law, and he is the advisor to advisors. He's worked with Bernie Sanders. He's worked with AOC. He's worked with Elizabeth Warren. He's worked with just about everybody in Capitol Hill. You see him all over the place. He knows everybody, everything. And and ultimately, just an all around brilliant man. So, with that said, please go back, sir. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, I'm lucky to know a fair number of people, even if not everybody. But I think you're. I'm probably luckiest to know you, Steve. It's it's really great to be on your shows and to talk about it. You ask the best questions and you have the best insights to offer. Um, but in any event, I mean, in the once when the Soviet Union collapsed, right in the ed, at the end of the 80s, early 90s. Um, of course, a lot of former members of the Soviet Union decided to kind of go their, their own way to one degree or another and be sort of separate countries. And Ukraine was one of them. But precisely what role or what relation Ukraine would have in relation to the Russian Federation, which is another remaining country after the Soviet Union's demise, and what relation it might have to Europe, on the other hand, was sort of unsettled um, and sort of contested. On the other hand, the Russians believed that certain things were going to happen, and they had very good reason to believe that because they were assured that by the West. So for one thing, you might remember that one of the conditions um, or, or one of the promises made by that first 
so-called President Bush, George H.W. Bush, to the Soviets and then to the Russians in, in, in return for their acquiescence to the reunification of Germany in 1989, was that NATO would never expand eastward. And as the Soviet Union then fell apart shortly, very shortly thereafter, again, these reassurances were continually repeated that, look, we're famous is, for that, right? Um, yeah, we're famous for that, right? That the, the NATO alliance had been forged in the first place as a sort of anti-Soviet alliance, and it was created on the basis of the claim, however plausible, that Stalin was an imperialist and wanted to expand the Soviet Union ever westward, and therefore we had to sort of stand up to Western, I mean, to Soviet westward expansionism and so forth. Well, if there wasn't going to be a Soviet Union any longer, it didn't really seem like there'd be much, much point in having a NATO uh, any longer. And it certainly seemed that there would be no point in expanding NATO eastward. And so there were various promises made later in the sort of early 1990s, as the Americans and other NATO members began to sort of talk about reneging on, on some of those promises, they sort of dangled before the Russians the prospect of Russian membership itself in NATO. Um, and Yeltsin had shown some interest uh, in that prospect, and Putin himself later showed some interest in that prospect. Another critical thing that happened during this period, you might remember, uh, it was in 1994, uh, Bill Clinton uh, and Boris Yeltsin together convinced the then leader of Ukraine to relinquish voluntarily all of Ukraine's nuclear weapons, because when the Soviet Union fell apart, a huge part of its nuclear arsenal had been based in Ukraine, as mentioned before, and it was still there when there was no longer a Soviet Union, but there was a Ukraine and there was a Russia. Uh, and so Bill Clinton uh, and Boris Yeltsin uh, signed, a entered into a treaty with the president of Ukraine, and pursuant to this treaty, Ukraine would give up its nuclear weapons, and in return for that, both Russia and the United States would guarantee its territorial integrity its sovereignty, its, its safety. Um, that treaty, by the way, is still in force, um, but it, it's probably not a convenient thing for anybody in Washington to remember right now, because I don't think that they're in the mood to go and sort of protect Ukraine's sovereignty with truth. But in any event, um, things, of course, you remember it, a lot of things, things happened in rapid succession after that, all of which are kind of relevant to right now. So you remember in 1995, then war broke out in the former Yugoslavia. Um, and originally it was between the Serbs and the Croats, but then later it was between the Serbs and the Bosnians as well. Now, interestingly, uh, Croatia, the, the Croats and the Serbs are basically one people sort of ethnically and linguistically. They speak the same language, conveniently called Serbo-Croatian. The only real difference was that the Serbs had at one time had their own country called Serbia, which had been uh, a Russian empire client state, right? Indeed, Russian protection of Serbia against Austria-Hungary after the assassination of the Austrian Archduke by a Serbian, Archduke by a Serbian nationalist in oh, is what brought us the first world war, right? So the Russians sort of thought of themselves as having an ancient role, a long-standing role as the sort of protectors of the Serbs who were also Russian Orthodox. The Croats, by contrast, like the Austrians were Roman Catholic and so had tended to move, be you know, sort of westward oriented. So of course, when the war broke out in Yugoslavia, as you remember, Bill Clinton, again, our, our hero, um, of course, intervened and led NATO to intervene on behalf of Croatia, and so bombed Belgrade, bombed the Serbs. That made the Russians furious, because again, this had been their sort of traditional client, and they thought maybe there ought to be a more even-handed approach to whatever the squabbles are that are going on there. But Bill Clinton... Yeah, sorry. Bob, no, Bob, Bob was trying to build a bridge to a new tomorrow right there, right? Yeah. He's building a bridge to a new tomorrow. A bridge to a <laughs> sorry, new just, tomorrow. Exactly. That was the idea, right? A bridge to a more points decent, light. Forget that. We got a bridge to tomorrow. Yeah, a more decent world, right? Where everybody can borrow <laughs> out of the wazoo and not have to worry about getting, you know, good paying jobs any longer. Don't, don't need good wages. Don't need good salaries because we've got cheap credit now. Um, yeah. So um, when the Russians kind of object, uh, Yeltsin in particular objected, Clinton and the West and NATO just kind of poo-pooed it, just kind of said, well, 
you know, tough toenails, tough toenails, man. Um, then, of course, you remember um, in 1999, once again, U.S. NATO intervened against Syria. I'm mean, sorry, against Serbia. Uh, Freudian slip there against uh, against Serbia. It's coming, uh, right? Yeah, it's coming up uh, on behalf, right, of Bosnia, and of you know, basically, this was the Kosovo affair. Once again, Yeltsin sort of, you know, shook his fist, fist was furious, was angry. Um, but of course, the Americans just kind of brushed it off. Meanwhile, NATO kept expanding eastward, kept taking into its membership countries that had previously been not only parts of the uh, Warsaw Pact, like Poland, for example, and the Czech Republic, but even parts of the Soviet Union, like the current Baltic republics, right? So, and of course, Yeltsin complained about that too, but they just ignored it. And things just kind of continued on that way, um, all the way into the early 2000s. You remember when George W. Bush, the next Bush, uh, decided to invade Iraq uh, unilaterally, essentially, mm -hmm. The Russians objected to that too. They thought that maybe you know this should be done more legally. <laughs> the Americans just ignored them. George Bush just said, you know, too bad. Uh, around the same period, of course, early two thousands, George Bush decided unilaterally to abrogate the anti ballistic treaty. Uh, I'm sorry, anti ballistic missile treaty that Reagan right. had entered. And and uh, again, the Russians were upset and they complained. And Bush just brushed it off. Just said, oh, that is so yesterday, man. We're not adversaries anymore. Don't worry. Um, and so just one Russian concern after another was simply ignored. Um, this, of course, led in significant measure. It wasn't the only cause, but it was a, an important cause in the coming to power of Vladimir Putin in the early 2000s, because Yeltsin was very widely viewed by the Russian people as a bum, a, a sort of a bungling weakling, because the West just kind of walked all over him, and he did, he couldn't do anything about it. So when you know, one of the things that Putin sort of ran on when he began to sort of move to power or toward power was that look, it's time to restore a bit of respect for 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 Russia and uh, restore a bit of dignity, and and maybe sort of stand up to these Westerners. Um, and Bush, of course, says, well, I could look into his soul. I looked into his eyes and I saw his soul, so no problem. But then, of course, 2008, what does Bush do? He invites Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO. Now, that was a red line, to use our other fearless leader, Obama's <laughs> language, for Putin. And Putin actually acted on the red line, and you might remember, he invaded briefly the country of Georgia in 2008 in order to kind of send a signal to kind of make it clear um, that no, not no further, right? You're getting a little too close to Russia here with your NATO expansions. And this, of course, sent a signal to NATO and to the West and to Ukraine as well. And so they started sort of slow walking the idea of Ukraine's joining NATO. Meanwhile, starting in the early 2000s, as you noted before, Steve, there's been there's constant strife within Ukraine as to what precisely its identity is going to be in this kind of post-Soviet world. Is it going to be sort of a kind of Russia-like country or a country that's kind of traditionally close to Russia as it always has been? Is it going to move a little bit more westward as, say, Poland was doing or the Czech Republic was doing? Or would it be sort of neither? Would it be kind of like Finland or Austria where it's not really a completely western or completely eastern, but it's just a kind of buffer zone in between them? What would happen? And as you know, there was lots of contestation coup attempts, actual coups, um, sometimes westernizing leaders being elected to office, other times easternizing or more Russian-leaning leaders um, uh, coming into power. Um, and all of this came to a particular head, at least as far as Mr. Putin was concerned, at the end of 2013 and early 2014, as you noted, uh, Steve, um, in the Maidan um, uprising. Yeah. The, the yes. president of Ukraine at the time had been kind of playing, I think, a pretty savvy game of sort of giving the Russians a bit to be hopeful about and sort of giving the West a bit to be hopeful about. Yeah, yeah. Did he not, uh, uh, Kachen, what is it, uh, Coach, what is this freaking name? I know it begins with a K. I believe it's Kachenko or something. He was president twice, and he lost out of it two times to a coup. Two yeah. times he was cooed. <laughs> Same yeah. guy. Twice, and one anyway. was uh, you know the the, the so-called Orange Revolution, and then the other two thousand four, oh, something like that. Exactly, and then the Maidan uprising about nine, ten years later, um, and you know in in both cases, you you had on the one hand you had a legitimate division of opinion and. Uh, 
sort of legitimate division of wishes on the part of significant parts of the two populations. There were definitely a lot of people who um, were upset when the president, once he was in office again, uh, started to slow walk what had been a more fast track movement toward joining the EU, not NATO, but the EU. Um, but Russia, of course, Putin put pressure on him to sort of slow down that process. And when he decided or when he announced he was going to join a Russian trading bloc instead of the EU, that was the the excuse or the trigger that led to a bunch of sort of protests in the city. Now, it's pretty well known um, that American intelligence agencies played some role in encouraging that uh, and presumably in aiding and abetting it as well. Uh, and so Putin, of course, not surprisingly, was convinced that this was basically just a CIA-backed coup or an American-backed coup. Um, I think that might slightly overstate it insofar as it does understate the degree to which lots of Ukrainian people really do want to become like another Czech Republic or another Poland rather than another Belarus, right? On the other hand, there's no question but that the US doesn't have clean hands in all of that, nor does the EU for that matter, and nor does NATO. Um, and so in effect, the kinds of adventurism and the kinds of sneaky skullduggery that the US is engaged in for pretty much the last hundred years at least when it comes to sort of covert type action, um, have certainly given Russia both plenty of reason to be suspicious, and plenty of ammunition when it comes to sort of ex, you know explaining away certain perceivedly anti-Russian occurrences because it's clear that however popular some of them might have been, it's not clear that they would have been popular enough to prevail without American assistance, right? Uh, and furthermore, it's just not open to Americans to say, "Oh, we weren't involved in that. That was entirely popular. That was a that was a beautiful people power thing, like in the Philippines, you know, when they got rid of you know." <laughs> <laughs> right of Ferdinand Marcos, right? It was just that. You know, it was because the president of Ukraine had too many shoes in the closet or whatever. You know, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, it, it puts the U.S. in a pretty creepy position. I mean, it's however sympathetic uh, some U.S. folk might reasonably or understandingly be with lots of Ukrainian people right now, the U.S. doesn't have clean hands, right? So meanwhile, um, of course, one way that Russia sort of responded to 2014 um, was it, it Presumably, Putin didn't feel quite strong enough or bold enough just to kind of go in and invade Ukraine altogether after that perceived coup um, uh, um, uh, succeeded. But he did find it easy enough to sort of take a foothold in the far east of Ukraine, which was predominantly ethnically Russian and, of course, almost entirely Russian speaking. Uh, and of course, he found uh, it convenient uh, and easy enough to take Crimea at the time. Now it's mm, worth. Yeah. Now there's been a lot of fuss, of course, about Crimea and how awful that was. But it's worth noting that Crimea. Putin is quite right. Crimea was not part of traditional Ukraine back when Ukraine was called the Ukraine as a part of Russia. Crimea was a sort of separate sort of province or enclave altogether for, for centuries. Um, and it was an important site of Russian naval activity because of its location, right? Russia has never had a year round warm water port with access to the Atlantic or the Pacific. Um, it's only had right what's up there around St. Petersburg, which is frozen over a good bit of the time up in the Baltic. So the closest thing that Russia has ever had to a sort of year round warm water port that might grant it access to the Atlantic is on the Black Sea. Um, but the only way to get to the Black Sea uh, from yeah. the Black Sea over to the Atlantic is through the Mediterranean. So you have to pass through the Straits of the Bosporus, which are controlled by Turkey or have been controlled by the Ottomans for 600 years. Uh, and Crimea is sort of right there in that little range or in that little zone. And so if you want to have, as a Russian military, a significant naval presence near the Black or on the Black Sea that gives you fairly put you fairly close to the Mediterranean and the Straits of the Bosporus on the way into the Mediterranean, that's kind of where you'd be. So Crimea has a long sort of history as, as essentially Russian dominated and Russian populated, owing to the imperatives of a, essentially access to warm water 
ports for a navy. So when, it's, sure, Putin didn't take that quote unquote legally in the sense that there wasn't some sort of world court decision that right. um, authorized it and there wasn't some security council resolution that said, yeah, sure, it belongs to Russia. But it is the case that it's not as exactly as though Putin just sort of took a chunk of Ukraine that had that was primarily Ukrainian people living in it and speaking Ukrainian and so forth. It's almost entirely Russian and had been a Russian resort area during the Romanov era as well. And indeed, it had only been sort of gifted uh, in rec relatively recent years uh, to Ukraine by Khrushchev, who himself was helpfully Ukrainian, uh, or at least from, from Ukraine. So Putin is on good historical ground there, even if it's a bit tetchy when he says things like, oh, the Ukrainians have never been a separate people, they're just Russians. That's kind of bullshit, but it's not surprising bullshit. <laughs> and it's quite comparable to the kinds of bullshit that we put out all the time. All the time. Um, but right. But um, and when it comes to sort of the, you know, sort of historical jurisdiction over uh, Crimea, he's on pretty firm ground on, on that one. But of course, everybody now, ever since he annexed it in 2014, sort of talks about that as emblematic of his imperialism and his desire to sort of take all of Ukraine and so forth. Um, and so bringing this up to the present time. Last week, um, you might remember when the when the sort of Russian action began. The first announcements by Putin were to the effect that he was going to recognize these two so-called breakaway republics in the far east of Ukraine um, as indeed independent republics. And this was a little bit, uh, actually, well, it was actually more noble. It was less ignoble, but it was a little bit like the U.S. recognizing the independence of Texas when it sort of broke away from Mexico, right, in 1836, right? Um, although it was a little bit more reasonable in the sense that those eastern parts of Ukraine had always been Russian ethnically and always been Russian speaking, whereas Texas was only ethnically Anglo because a ton of Americans had themselves, in effect, invaded Mexico, <laughs> the Mexican territory yeah. of, of, of Texas, although I'm slightly over speaking because they were invited in. But nevertheless, they Anglicized this Mexican territory and then finally decided, hey, we've so anglicized this place, let's break away. And then the US, hey, welcome Texas, Lone Star country or Republic. And then of course added them to the US nine years later, which helped to trigger of course the Mexican war. At which time we uh, we stole Can uh, we stole uh, uh, California, New Mexico, and Arizona. Basically, got our whole southwest. But anyway, so um, what Putin when Putin first made that announcement, and it looked like Russian troops might go in essentially to assist with the sort of breaking away of those um, uh, little sort of statelets. Um, even that didn't shock me too much, and it didn't even seem to me that the Western side or the, the West that the West should get its knickers in a twist or should clutch its pearls too much. Because again, it's it's not as though this was somehow terribly surprising. And it's not as though those particular areas were particularly Ukrainian. I do, however, as you know, worry a great deal now uh, about action around uh, Kyiv, which is without a doubt Ukrainian, and around Kharkiv nearby, which is without a doubt Ukrainian and certain other cities and places in Ukraine. And I'm, literally praying that there's not, you know, a bunch of civilian death and a bunch of destruction. Um, but, you know, it's hard to tell at this point where that's all going to go. Talk to me about the Donbass region. I mean, this, this seems to be the, the, the Nazi angle. The, obviously there is a neo-Nazi presence in Ukraine. That's, that's right. a given. That's, that's not even a question. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't believe it's as big as we make it out to be, but I also don't believe it's an insignificant thing because like Chris Hedges says, we fight fascists, not because we'll win, but because they're fucking fascists. Yeah. So yeah. talk to me about the Donbass region. I want to, I want to get that one down too. Yeah. So Donbass is one of those Eastern regions uh, that has been primarily Russian speaking and primarily ethnically Russian for uh, forever. I mean, basically as long as we have historical records. So um, it's kind of in a sense natural, so to speak, or at least not altogether surprising um, that insofar as the tensions in Ukraine can be at least partly attributed to that mixed history of Ukraine as having once been half Austro-Hungarian, Roman Catholic, Western, and half Romanov, Russian, Soviet, Russian Orthodox, insofar as that's the traditional divide running through Ukraine, which is a strikingly similar to divide to that between the Serbs and the Croats in the former Yugoslavia, 
it's not surprising, right, that A, um, the Russians would, including Putin, would feel a kind of special responsibility for and even a kind of ownership of that part of Ukraine. And B, that insofar as there's neo-Nazi activity uh, in Ukraine, that some of it or lots of it might even target regions like that, right? Parts like right. places in Ukraine like Donbass. Um, it's worth noting in this connection that, you know, there's a, a kind of a long-standing history of um, Serbo-Croatian, I'm sorry, uh, not Serbo, Croatian collaboration with the Nazis during the 1930s and 40s on the one hand, and Western Ukrainian collaboration with the Nazis at the same during the same period. And furthermore, there's quite relatedly a history of collaboration between the Croats and just Germans before there were Nazis, long before the coming to power of Hitler. And likewise, Western Ukraine, much more collaboration with Germans or German Austrians in the distant past too. Again, because of their location and because of the traditional rivalries going way back centuries, between the, Austria the Austro-Hungarian or Habsburg Empire on the one hand and the Russian or Romanov Empire on the other, right? And this can't be, overestim this can't be overstated, um, even though it seems to be somehow forgotten. The importance of the, the sort of Russian Orthodox culture and Russian language and Romanov history in, from the Eastern part of Ukraine and from Serbia on eastward on the one hand, and the Catholic, more Western-leaning history of Croatia and Western Ukraine on the other hand, going way back, again, many centuries, can't, cannot be overstated, and yet it tends to be understated over and over and over again. It has just always been the case, you know, at least in all of, you know, going way back to pre-modern times, that those on the Western sides of the divide in these, middling, these middle countries, these middle-range countries like Ukraine, and Yugoslavia, that the Western sides of them have always collaborated with Germans because the Germans have been the most powerful force against the Russians in their lives, right? So insofar as they've wanted to resist Russian encroachments, they've seen Germany as the perfect big brother, so to speak, to help them out. And similarly, anytime German empires or German militaries have seemed threatening to the more Eastern members of these groupings, like Eastern Ukrainians or to Serbians, they've looked eastward to Russia for help, right? Russia's their big brother. And what's tragic, of course, is that these people are almost identical ethnically and linguistically, right? Western Ukrainians and Eastern Ukrainians are one people ethnically, and they're almost one people linguistically, but they've been divided right down the middle because of history, because half of them used to be under Russian jurisdiction, so to speak. And back in the days of those empires, there wasn't a separation of church and state. The Russian Orthodox Church was the state church, and just as the, you know, the czar was the, the absolute ruler for everybody. And then on, on the Western side of the divide, the Roman Catholic Church was the state church of the Habsburg Empire. It was the state church of Austria and of Austria-Hungary. And so what you had is anytime then you had squabbles or struggles between Catholic Ukrainians, most Western Ukrainians are Catholic, anytime you had struggles between Catholic Ukrainians and Orthodox Ukrainians or sort of westward-leaning Ukrainians and eastward-leaning Ukrainians, you always had temptations that on the part of the big big brother in the East, Russia, and big brother in the West, Germany or Austria-Hungary, to come to the aids of their little client peoples, right? And so when we call the uh, Western Ukrainians uh, or some of those who act neo-Nazis, there's truth in that because there was collaboration by a lot of these folks' grandparents or great-grandparents with the Nazis. But that wasn't just because they, you know, agreed with Aryan supremacy. Indeed, they were Slavs. I mean, there was a sort of irony in being a Ukrainian Nazi because as far as Nazi ideology was concerned, you were you know, untermensch, right? You were subhuman if you were not Aryan. So it was a weird sort of thing, a weird sort of alliance or, or, or sort of bedfellow thing in the first place. But I think it's basically because they were less interested in Nazis than they were in Germans. And because Germans and Nazis were the same at that time, that's where it comes from. So I don't mean in saying this to, un to downplay 
the absolute racism uh, and you know ethnic sort of uh, uh, ethnic triumphalism, and even just outright Nazi ideologizing on the part of some Western Ukrainians, because I'm sure some have just decided, well, you know, because we were founded by a Viking sort of settlement in Kiev a long time ago, we're actually Aryan. There's, there are all kinds of ways people come up with to sort of rationalize their membership in groups that ironically probably wouldn't have accepted them as far as the, the, the purists in the old days were, were concerned. But, but in any event, that's, it's definitely the case that there is this kind of Nazi presence. But this is, I think, probably also largely just a matter of traditional uh, reliance on your German big brothers to the West in your centuries long struggle with those who have Eastern big brothers in Moscow, you know, going back to the 1500s, the 1600s and so on. So what I want to do is I want to kind of pivot from some of the historical side to some of the stuff that I am deeply suspicious might be the underlying factors that are going on in the current situation. So we know all the historical revelations. We know the ethnic revelations. We know the geopolitical side to this. But I believe there's another aspect here. And folks that follow uh, the G7 and follow the WTO and the IMF and all the other insanity that goes on with U.S. led. Let's be fair. U.S. led. We, we are the world reserve currency and we leverage the IMF and the World Trade Organization and all the rest of that NGO apparatchik to yeah. freaking force our will around the world. And really our chief <clears throat> export, I believe, neoliberalism, right? We, we love to export complete privatization. We love to export Mitt Romney's Bain capital. We want to be that guy. And yeah. so what do we do? We have the WTO, or, um, excuse me, the IMF come in and say, we're here to help. We're from the IMF. Yeah. And they offer them loans to be able to help them because Ukraine has never really gotten off the ground. It's got all those resources and none of the productive capacity. They have never been able to get off their feet because they've been in constant conflict, constant war, constant shelling. It's just impossible to generate the kind of here and now industrial power it would take to be thriving on their own. So while they've got all these real resources, they are in essence captive to imports because they don't have the productive capacity to take care of themselves because of all these things. WTF, I mean, WTO and the IMF and the World Bank come in and they say, well, here's the deal. We're going to give you this money. We're going to lend you these things, but here's some structural adjustments you've got to agree to. So they've got austerity measures and they're going on right now as part of their financial, fiscal, you know, getting well plan. Your get well plan includes austerity, right? Yeah. So they, they implement this. And then all the while, simultaneously, I mean, I think it's like some three billion, it was 2.8 billion, some some ridiculous number for them anyway, in foreign US denominated debt. Debt yeah. they can't print at their way out of. There's no way for Ukraine to print their way out of that mess. That mm -hmm. is foreign denominated debt. So mm -hmm. now, like we did in Venezuela, and fo folks, if you read, you know, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, whether it be a hundred percent like a, a you know a fact based story, or whether it be a little bit of a James Bond type thing, eh, you can debate that. I think it's probably closer to true than not. And in this particular case, we see the IMF has got its claws deeply embedded in Ukraine right now. Ukraine, 12 percent of the wheat export for the entire world. They are like number one or number two and all these different, you know, real resources like from titanium, lithium, petroleum, you name it all corn. Oh, my God. They could feed the world. They, In fact, Russia depends heavily on the food production of Ukraine. Yeah. So with the IMF latching its claws in there. Its purpose, the IMF, is to strip away the public space and literally free it up, make it better to do business, make it easier to do business, right? Yeah. This is our this is how we go to war. This is how we do all sorts of things. Yeah. So I believe full heartedly that while there's all these things going on, I believe that when you get down to it, follow the money. I think this is a money story in in not even a money story, really a real resource grab, the giant sucking sound of that vacuum siphoning out the real resources from Ukraine. 
with promises they'll make it better, but simultaneously stripping them as they've done in Africa, stripping them as they've done in South America, stripping them as they've done in Central America. Yeah. So tell me what the role is of this. I am and just the other day, the IMF came out and said, we're here to help. We're going to do even more for you, Ukraine. Mm-hmm. I see a tie in with NATO being sort of the police bulldog for uh, the IMF and vice versa to impose or at least to appear to be, you know, protecting them, but simultaneously raping them of their mm-hmm. real resources. Am I being hyperbolic or is there some merit here? I think there's definitely a lot of merit there, Steve. I think um, I think there's a kind of good news and bad news story here, or maybe there are sort of two possible good news stories depending on you know the outcome, of course, um, and one possible really bad news story. And if there's any silver lining in the current developments, it's that the worst bad news story now, I think, is less likely to succeed. So the worst bad news story, I think, is the one that you've just told, right? You've essentially got a very, very rich country in terms of the resources, um, both um, under the ground, in the ground, and sort of above the ground, and also just in the in the population. I mean, these are this the Ukrainians are an immensely well-educated people on a per capita basis, an immensely creative um, and um, able people. Um, they've got a great industrial sort of history as probably the most industrial sector or section of or portion of um, the old Soviet Union uh, during its industrial heyday. Um, and so there's a great deal of sort of human potential, a lot, a great deal of industrial potential. And then, as you noted, a great deal of resource potential. Indeed, it bears noting um, that one of the reasons uh, that Hitler didn't get to Moscow during the big invasion, the Nazi invasion of Russia or the Soviet Union uh, in the summer, uh, summer of 1941, when they were sort of getting, they were like, I think, almost two thirds of the way there within just a few weeks. But Hitler decided to divert the armies that were going to go straight on to Moscow down to take Kiev because he said, you know, we need this Ukraine territory first and foremost to feed ourselves and to get at the petroleum down further south at Maripol um, and basically down in the South Caucasus oil fields. The access to them was down through southern Ukraine. Um, And so Hitler basically, you know, forego, decided to forego taking Moscow before winter, which is the only way he was going to be able to take it in order to get yeah. Ukraine. And that tells you something about just how much is there. And I think you're right that, you know, uh, the IMF and a lot of the sort of Western interests, basically economic, financial, um, industrial interests uh, and energy interests uh, in Ukraine are basically prompted by that. The sense, and that that would be, and insofar as NATO expansion could be viewed as a sort of adjunct to all of that, then yeah, there was a kind of sinister game uh, afoot. Insofar as that's where what we where we were sort of headed. Um, the sense in which is a silver lining uh, uh, under present circumstances is that's just not going to happen now. I think whatever comes out of, you know, whatever sort of peace agreement uh, or, or, well, whatever outcome comes from the current uh, war going on there, it's not going to be that, right? The, the, the Russians are not going to allow or agree to any sort of final settlement that involves Ukraine being exploited by and used by, you know, Western IMF member countries. But that opens the door to the two sort of somewhat better case scenarios that one might imagine, right? So one thing that one might imagine, and I'm, I'm still not sure why this couldn't have happened even in 2014, is remember back in 2014 at the time of what the Russians believe was a coup and what some Western Ukrainians view as a popular uprising, and I, I just can't adjudicate on that one. But at that time, you might remember that the, the big struggle was was Ukraine going to join a Russian-led economic community, uh, basically a, the, the, the sort of so-called Russian Commonwealth of, 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 of states, or was it going to join the European Union, right? Which common market, so to speak, was it going to join? And I remember even at the time thinking, well, why does Ukraine have to choose? Why can't it just be a member of both? Why couldn't it be a hybrid country that belongs to both of those economic unions? And that might ultimately lead to some sort of further integration of the Russian block of countries with the Western ones, which then might 
uh, sort of have a salutary influence on where things go, even in the West, because the Russians, as you know, and as you will remember, maybe had a really awful experience with IMF style restructuring and rational um, oh, yes. uh, right, uh, privatization and so forth in the 1990s. All these Harvard economists went over there and they basically just converted the country into a kleptocracy. It was just just absolute disaster. And it's hard to imagine uh, many Russian people then being particularly enamored of the idea of Western style restructuring. Um, and so had Ukraine been able to be a member both of the EU and of the Russian bloc of, of countries, maybe it could have served as some kind of a sort of conduit of you know sort of more sensible thinking from the Eastern side over to the West. Now, I can imagine something like that happening now. I mean, it's probably a starry eyed um, sort of overly sanguine view but you can that's, imagine one settlement being, all right, how about they get to be a member of both? Well, that's. I want to jump to SWIFT for a minute because yeah. we, we're running out of time, and I want to make sure we get this in. So obviously the Western nations have cut off Russia through the SWIFT gut, you know. You see lines. In fact, Colin, if you wouldn't mind, cue up the uh, video of the uh, uh, the Russians going to the ATM machine so you all can see what has happened it's kind of it's kind of insane over there and when you see this you'll feel like the gas lines of the 70s maybe <laughs> this is a terribly exciting folks and we're not going to look at it forever but i it, it's worth taking a peek at i mean goodness gracious this is just to get money out of the freaking atm machines i mean they, they, without having access to swift they can't purchase goods and services outside of Russia, period. They are literally cut off. Now, I don't think Putin is necessarily going to be hurt by this, but the people are. And the idea of sanctions is always with the intention of making the local civilians, the people of the country in theater, to freaking turn on their leaders, to, to make them have a coup, to make them have a revolution, to make them say, no mas, whatever, whatever that is, basta, whatever, you know. And so here we are. I don't, I don't think we've ever seen sanctions work in that way. Sanctions usually turn people more nationalistic, more supportive of their leaders, seeing the rest of the world attacking them. And that sense of pride and homeland or motherland or whatever starts picking back up. But, but obviously these kinds of sanctions, they really hurt the regular people. Yeah. Talk to me, because if I'm not mistaken, the ruble just dropped down below a penny. For God's sake, it's the lowest it's been in forever. Yeah. So, I mean, they're they're hurting because if their currency, which is not free-floating in its truest sense, if their currency is valued at such, all the foreign debt that Russia holds is now going to be like Venezuela and all the other ones that got jacked up when their currency was devalued based against a peg, like in those countries, they pegged against the dollar. Russia, I'm not sure what they have a peg on. Do they have a peg on the dollar? Do they have some sort of peg like that? I mean, I'm not sure. I don't fully understand the ruble or the the, the dynamic of the regime of the Russian currency. But regardless, I mean, it's close to free floating. It was. And I know the Russian Central Bank has taken a few steps here to, to counter what was just done. Mm -hmm. So talk. we only have a few minutes, so I'm so sorry. I wanted to get into this more. But Talk a little bit about what these sanctions are doing and what the central bank's response is. Yeah, sort of maybe two things are worth highlighting here, Steve. Um, on the one hand, you're, you're, of course, right that the sanctions are typically sort of aimed at turning the populace against their leadership. And sometimes that works and sometimes it has the, the contrary effect. It simply makes people feel as though they themselves are being personally attacked, in effect, by this imperial power that's, you know, kind of reaching into their own country. Um, and, you know, whether the, the sort of current sort of round of sanctions, even it is, let's say whether the current round of sanctions absent any kind of pressure valve would have one effect or the other is kind of hard to tell at the moment. I mean, Putin has been quite masterful over the years um, at sort of getting the Russian public to sort of identify with him and his position and just sort of think of this as Russia being screwed by the world and in particular by the, the U.S.-led world that's been kind of, and it's not too hard to sort of make people believe that there's something Russophobic 
in American policy over the last 30 years, because it has been. I mean, how many people have we heard, you know, sort of talking about Putin as some kind of a thug or a dictator or a monster or whatever? Whereas in many ways, maybe he's gotten, maybe he's sort of losing it now. I don't know. But I mean, for his first 20 years, at least, he was enormously popular in Russia because he was kind of reversing all of the losses that Yeltsin experienced when the West just walked all over him. So whether Putin could kind of keep up that kind of popular sort of support of himself and his position against the West, um, it's possible that he might. It's maybe possible that there's more dissent, and it's just hard to tell which way that would go, again, absent any pressure valve. But there's the critical caveat. There's a huge pressure valve to let off the pressure that, that Russia has, um, and that's China. Right. Um, there's at this point, you know, Russia has up to this point been primarily an exporter of petroleum and uh, of unfinished products, basically unfinished resources Please. to the West in return for, again, manufactured goods. Right. But, you know, last I checked, China is pretty productive with manufactured goods as well. And it's got a huge border with Russia. And China is in great need of Russian energy resources as well. Um, and as you know, they've been moving closer and closer in recent years, even to the point of almost formalizing a kind of alliance. Now, I do think that the reaction to Russia um, in the last few days has been a, a bit more vehement and a bit more unified than anybody was expecting so that China itself is probably feeling a little bit more leery than it would have felt about being overt in its support for Russia. But that's not to say anything about covert assistance. And it's very easy for me to see President Xi on the one hand talking about respecting territorial boundaries and sovereignty and getting a ceasefire as soon as possible, and maybe even kind of meaning that. But at the whole time, you know, being willing sort of out of eye shot, so to speak, to do all sorts of trading directly with Russia. And that could just be barter, in effect. I mean, Russia wouldn't need dollars at all um, or any dollar related assets for this. It could just send, it could just swap oil and other resources for the other goods that it needs from China. And it would just be that, that simple. I mean, they would have to figure out, you know, exchange rates and so forth, but it would basically just be China, Russia trade. That would be, a, a, that would be autarkic. You know, they're, they're looking and seeing Bitcoin rise through the freaking roof. Now, obviously, one of the factors of crypto that allows states that are under sanctions by the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, to get around those sanctions is, in fact, to leverage crypto. And, yeah. and you see, I mean, it's blown up. Like, obviously, they're, they're, they're using it. In, like, if you were to devise the best scenario to use crypto in, they're using it in that way at this moment. Mm -hmm. what 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 does that mean to russia in general obviously i, I consider crypto like an envelope it's mm -hmm. carrying somebody's currency in the envelope and it's just a way of masking it and sending it around and you mm -hmm. can on one side put it in the u.s dollars the other side take it out as mm -hmm. you know, yen or you know yuan or whatever what what is the gameplay here with russia using crypto I think that if this if, if this had all been happening about a year or two ago, Russia might have been able to make up some of its losses by essentially tapping into that kind of shadow financial system uh, that is kind of basically global crypto exchanges. But as you know, Stephen, as we've talked about before, most Western governments have been enacting, have been acting, um, or I should say, sort of pursuing a, a rather significant crackdown on crypto crypto exchanges. China too, by the way. And China as well, right? Um, and fintech more generally. So I actually think given the enormity of Russia's financial needs and, and debt servicing needs and other needs on the one, I shouldn't say debt servicing, but it's uh, trade servicing needs and other needs uh, on the one hand and these clampdowns that have been actually quite zealous uh, on the other hand, I don't think that it would be able to sort of recoup even a tiny fraction of what it's currently losing, financially speaking, by accessing those exchanges or those particular markets. But again, because basically Russia and China, if you think of them as one economy, sort of jointly constitute essentially an autarkic system that doesn't need any resources or financial money, any financial sort of know-how or financing from the West at all at this point, Given that, uh, as long as Xi is able to do this sort of to some extent under the table or out of eye shot, 
I don't think Russia has any problems at all with with basically being able to bring in whatever goods it needs, whatever manufactured products it needs, and simply to buy it all with energy exports. I mean, interestingly enough, this is kind of the way the Nazis financed their own rearmament in the lead up to the Second World War, because as you know, they were under significant monetary restraints or constraints after the First World War too. So all they did, you know, their, their finance minister, Helmer Schacht, just basically entered into these essentially barter, bilateral barter arrangements with all of the surrounding countries. So Germany would just trade literal goods of the kind that it had in abundance for what it needed from neighboring countries on a kind of one by one basis. And it was just sort of bilateral nation to nation barter. Um, and Germany was able effectively to kind of supply itself with everything it needed simply by doing that with a few strategically chosen nearby countries. Russia has it much easier than Germany had it in the 30s. Everything it needs is available from China. So with the Belt and Road Initiative, I think I said that correctly, yeah. uh, China is preparing to create a, and I mean, I, I these are the moments, I know people probably hate me for saying this, but there are times I wish I was Chinese because of how ridiculously insightful they've been. Yeah. How, in my opinion, they are the ultimate, in central planning. I've never seen anyone do quite as much as they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, there's a lot of things we can quibble about, not quibble. I mean, it's some bad things, but mm -hmm. from this angle, they are building the most robust supply chain, the most robust transport system through that country to get those goods and services out of there. And if you look at the port cities, my God, it's you're looking at things that look like they're alien made alien weaponry yeah. folks. I mean, yeah. it's huge I ports, that. amazing yeah. looking things. But, but with that in mind, obviously they're also got a mind for Russia here as well. That whole initiative is going to tie Russia even more so. So whatever we do this direction, man, you've got a, a landmass, the size of Holy crap. That has super amounts of people, super amounts of real resources, great productive capacity and they don't need us anymore quite frankly no they definitely don't i mean they did for a long time but they are pretty much there at the point now that they're not just sort of getting stuff from us and then sort of you know kind of re-engineering it or, or kind of you know sort of backward designing it or whatever um at this point they've got basically complete autonomy when it comes to the design of most of the sort of high-end manufacturing techniques and technologies and in some, they've even pulled ahead uh, of the U.S. and pulled ahead of the West. Oh, yeah. In some cases, we're going to have to, you know, kind of steal intellectual property from them rather than worry about them stealing intellectual property from us. So I, I got a quick story to tell. I'm sorry to interrupt. I got to get this in real quick, and then I'll let you back. I went to Beijing and I went to Shanghai as I completed my MBA program. And I was, I was going through there. Beijing was kind of neat. Got to go to the university, got to go to all the, the, the tourist traps, but I got to listen to the folks at Beijing university talking with uh, alumni from my university, talking about the brokerages that they use to broker U S business into China. Cause you can't really own things there. You have to have sort of like a, a, a person there vouching for you, if you will. Right. And so, so there's a little bit of a greasing of the palms to keep things going. But as you go to Shanghai and Shanghai makes New York city look like a, a tiny little nothing burger. Yeah. I was blown away. The roadways were the size of football fields yeah. and it was packed people like just walls of people going each way, yeah. not cars, people. Yeah. And but the thing is, is that it is still trapped between being an old country, an ancient country, and a new country. Because mm -hmm. I'm walking down the street in my Italian loafers and I step one foot on a nice, beautiful thing, looking at these gorgeous parapets and all these wild digital signs, and immediately step in open raw sewage and my shoe gets stuck in it because they got like wooden pipes going oh. to the thing. And so it's like literally ancient meets like cutting edge all at once yeah. and i think that you're watching them say uh-uh we're gonna blow past you we're gonna go ipv6 optical all the way the mm -hmm. highest end technology you name it and mm -hmm. russia's right there too and russia's gonna benefit from that as well and oh, you want to talk about the u.s not investing in infrastructure 
boy, oh boy, are we in for a freaking doozy of an yeah. ass kicking in very short order. Sorry, yeah. I know this is about Ukraine. I know this is about, but I think this is an important tell because we are a part of this mix here, whether we realize it or not. Part of Biden's Build Back Better, part of his saber rattling against China was mm -hmm. to develop a bit of a Cold War mindset to get us willing to blow money to build up our infrastructure that got shot down. Well, they're kicking ass. They don't yeah. have any pretensions. They're there to beat our asses. So, yeah, well, and they're actually they're deciding it, right? They're saying, yeah, we're going to pass. We're going to pass right by you, right? And what's sort of funny is, you know, when Khrushchev said the same thing in the 1960s, you know, we're going to bury your asses. We're going to, you know, surpass you. Everybody panicked and everybody got all worried, and so they plowed all kinds of money into science education and engineering and all kinds of highway projects and all sorts of throughout the 1960s in response to that we will bury you china now says we will bury you and we just say ah, fucking democrats man they're, they're transgender bathrooms man it's just not fair that we have transgender people on on women's swimming teams you know and that's what we're on about right that's that's what we're concerned with and so i think you know if i were i mean if i were chinese i would feel kind of satisfied right now i think oh you know we don't even, this is like child's play we're distracted we're good themselves exactly and this you know this, the latest in ukraine is just another it's like that ridiculous uh godfather three film you know where al pacino keeps saying they keep dragging me back in like every yeah. time you know how many times is the u.s said pyramid to asia pyramid to asia and then oh but let's invade iraq first oh let's you know let's stay in it let's uh in, occupy afghanistan first and now it's oh you know we got to deal with this ukraine business first there's never going to be a pivot to asia there's never going to be a build back better it doesn't look like it anyway it looks like we're just gonna you know basically become a backwater Shrivel um, away and die like a skin tag with a rubber band on it. There we are. <laughs> or a hemorrhoid <laughs> with a rubber band. <laughs> exactly. With a little bit of maybe liquid <laughs> nitrogen added in. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, so let's put a bow on this. Ultimately, at this point in time, obviously, people are talking about negotiations and getting resolution. This is going to be an unfolding story. And over the next couple of days, we'll continue to cover this. Right. Um, but, Bob, your parting thoughts. Well, I guess my parting thoughts are, you know, and again, this is totally Pollyannish, but I would no, like you, Mr. Optimist there. Right? You know, you know, we've talked about this before, metabolic optimism, right? I mean, I, I just keep hoping that there will be a moment of clarity among the Westerners to realize that Putin has real grievances, has real concerns that are justified. Um, and he might be making some claims now that are unjustified, but I'm hoping that the West can sort of focus on the justifiable grievances, the real grievances and the justifiable claims and concerns that they can offer something that Putin can kind of go on or go with that would give him a kind of face saving off ramp from a complete, you know, sort of annihilation of Ukraine. And then, then what emerge after what might emerge from all of that in the end is a Ukraine that's neither more East than West nor more West than East, but somehow finds a way to be kind of partly integrated into the Western economies and partly integrated into the Eastern economies. And that at some point, the West's relation with Russia itself will become more functional because in the long run, I would think that Putin might be somewhat worried about the embrace of China more than he would by by the embrace of Europe if he were eventually to join Europe. Because if it becomes a dyadic partnership of Russia, China, Russia is the junior partner for sure. Yeah, they are. And I don't think Russians are very comfortable with being, you know, second fiddles. Um, if they were part of the sort of European constellation, they would be the biggest country in it. Um, or they would be one of the two biggest, along with the U.S., with Germany as a kind of close third. And they could have a, you know, feel a little bit more prestige, perhaps, or a little bit more sort of status uh, if they were a part of that. But we just have this real gift for driving them over to China because we just keep telling them, you're just a dictator. You're just a fascist. You're just, you know, backward. You're, you know, evil. You're psychotic. And Sarah Palin sees you from her kitchen window <laughs> and is terrified. So fuck you, you know. And, you know, I, I liked, I'd like to think that at some point we can get off of that. <laughs> but we've had 30 I, years. I, if it doesn't fit on a fucking bump sticker bob nobody cares i i hate it i mean like i'll give you an example this this stream we just did right now was a phd level class a course on international geopolitical historical references etc and and you know I, I for those who witness this i really am grateful that you stuck around because this is the meat and potatoes that if you listen to this again 
you fill it in with some of the latest breaking news and stuff like that and sort of filter it through an understanding of class struggle, through an understanding of uh, the geopolitical and the religious connotations and the historical uh, roots. The one thing that we didn't talk about that I would have loved to talk about, and I'll throw this out there as a teaser for something we might talk about tomorrow night. Russia didn't know anything about private property up until relatively recently. Russia was very much not a, you know, they, they were a communist country. And when they lost that thing, it changed. And you, you talked about it a little bit, but I think that's, there's more to that story that needs to be ferreted and out. Than, and even traditional peasant ar- uh, agriculture in Russia before the Soviet period, right? In fact, Marx often in, in, in capital viewed Russia as a kind of indi- what he called primitive communism, a kind of pre-capitalist formation where you actually had peasant tillage of the soil and you had private property in the sense that a few feudal land barons owned everything. But basically the way production occurred was through peasant labor on these kind of communal farming arrangements. Um, And then of course you had the Soviet collectivization right after that. Um, And that does play a really important role, I think, and or it goes a long way in explaining a lot of the way things work presently. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it gets us reasonably Absolutely. hopeful, frankly, um, about uh, alternative ways of doing things. But, you know, uh, That's for a story for another day, we <laughs> might talk on another occasion. Yeah. For various reasons that this hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Well, listen, Bob Hockett, genius, historian, brilliant legal mind, et cetera. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, folks. And thank you, Bob, as always, for presenting things in the most ridiculously accurate way. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks so much, Steve. Always a joy. And as I've said before, I always learn more than I convey in these things. So thanks so much. You got I, I, It's wonderful. Folks, thank you so much for joining us. I'll be back later to give a uh, assessment of uh, Biden's speech. Um, so in the meantime, have a great one. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe, do all the stuff that Jordan normally says. There you go. There it is. Colin, thank you so much, man. And everybody, thank you so much for sticking with us. We'll talk to you later. We're out of here.